Did you ever find yourself thinking, man, I wish there was a gender-swapped version of the Terminator? Well, then today's movie is for you. Welcome to Sick Flicks, where I take a deep dive into the cinematic sewer to help you embrace your inner gore geek. I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, and today we're tackling Fred Olin Ray's Terminator riff, Alienator. Released in 1990, Alienator takes the idea of an unstoppable intergalactic android bounty hunter and gender swaps it. Instead of getting Schwarzenegger in the title role, we get Tegan Clive, a famous female bodybuilder who wanted to be the lady version of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Add in an all-star B-movie cast featuring Jan Michael Vincent, John Philip Law, and Ross Hagen, and, well, you have a movie. <laughs> or something sort of like a movie. We're gonna go down in the history books. But enough about that. Can Alienator blast its way to a five barf bag rating? Let's get to the gore and find out. Oh, and before we get started, today's video is sponsored by patrons Hugo Zapata, Mario McQuay, and Justin G. If you'd like to sponsor some videos and help free me from the shackles of YouTube's tyranny, you'll find a link to my Patreon in the pinned comment in the description below. And now, let's get bloody. We fade in on the credits. The MGM logo for a movie like this feels like a delusion of grandeur. But not as delusional as this. <laughs> Majestic? Wow, this flick has a lot to live up to. That brings us back to Earth. This is many years before Fred Olin Ray started directing skin flicks as Nicholas Medina. Not gonna lie, kinda wish we were watching The Busty Housewives of Beverly Hills or Dirty Blondes from Beyond instead of Alienator. In a far off corner of the galaxy, taxation of trade routes to outlying star systems is in dispute. Oh wait, I misread that. I thought someone switched reels to Phantom Menace on me. Fun fact, this opening crawl is actually longer than the shooting script. <laughs> no, not really. With the text position done, we hop into the movie proper with Jan Michael Vincent. Not even two minutes in and I'm regretting this movie choice already. You ready for your big day, scum? And here's Ross Hagen. Fans of Mystery Science Theater will remember him from Side Hackers and Hellcats. The rest of the world? Won't. I'm not sure what Ross is wearing here, but I admire the puffy vest and wristbands look. I think my Halloween costume is set. Jan Michael Vincent tries to bump some beer money from Ross through a bunch of empty threats. But all we need to know here is that Ross is a bad guy and he's bound for execution. Ross isn't enjoying all of Jan's tough talk, but his attack quickly turns into a beating because JMV has what we in the business call drunk strength. Oh yeah, pimp fist right in the bread basket. This movie may redeem itself yet. Ross doesn't care though, because he's got a bag full of bugs. I never had a problem a bag full of bugs couldn't solve. Over in Chernobyl, PJ Souls is still trying to figure out how to get Bob's ghost. Does she know that her boob windows are open? How embarrassing. There's some weird costume design in this movie. Ross has no sleeves, PJ's missing half her shirt. I guess they really had to cut corners to stay under budget. When I want your interpretation, Tara, I'll ask for it. After browbeating her, Jan Michael Vincent violates this guy's personal space. Someone needs to call HR before this gets out of hand. Wow. Look at that hook pattern. Hey, it's Joe Pilato. I'm glad he recovered from getting ripped in half and devoured. I guess they did choke on him. And here's Lund, who looks like a pimp version of Scotty from Star Trek. I bet that gold chain has a giant Mercedes medallion on it. I don't want to ruin the immersion here, but I don't think they filmed this on a spaceship. This looks suspiciously like a power plant. While that's going on, PJ Soul shows Scotty how to run the most advanced crockpot in the universe. But she can't get it to cook this prisoner. Then the movie gets pervy. Very hard on her. Whoa, TMI. Jam Michael jiggles a couple of wires and tries it again. <laughs> Here we go. Now Ross Hagen gets to see what's gonna happen to him next. I, for one, can't believe Fred Olin Ray didn't steal the Star Trek transporter sound effect for this. What a missed opportunity. Ross doesn't want to get beamed up to creepy Scotty, so he gives these guards a taste of his pimp hand. And a pimp phaser. Man, that railing really needs a railing. Dude's really fallen head over heels. With the law on his tail, Ross heads to the nearest dead mall to pick up his GNC pills. Gotta bulk up, too bad they're already closed. So he stops to play laser tag with Jan and his bros first. <laughs> These guys shoot like stormtroopers. And somehow this scene is still going on. Back in the control center, JMV realizes Ross is here to steal Airwolf. Budget Scotty is no Ernest Borgnine. You know what would make all of this better? Putting Joe Pilato in this scene and letting him scream about monkey farms. I'm running this monkey farm now, Frankenstein! Ross, meanwhile, is trying to escape. Looks like he's wandered into Suspiria, judging by this lighting. He doesn't find any witches, but he does find this guy stroking his barrel. Hell yeah. No, not like that, you pervs. I mean, he's fondling his rifle. 
Wait, that still sounds dirty. His secret bag from earlier pays off as he slams eight months worth of scarabs into the last guard's face. Dude must have just hit puberty because he's got some blackheads. And thanks to the magic of cutaways, our heroes tip a few back as they lament their missing inmate, video game voice actor Ross Hagen. I don't believe I let him get away. Fun fact, Ross was the voice of Landon Ricketts in Red Dead Redemption. Jam Michael, with nowhere to turn, decides to call out the Hunter Unit. Call out the Hunter Unit. The Hunter Unit? With Fred Dreyer? I loved Hunter. And 13 minutes into the movie, we finally get some credits. Jam Michael Vincent and John Philip Law. I hope everyone has three names in this flick. Check out this title card. Is that futuristic? Looks more like a Conan spinoff to me. Jesus, it looks like someone sneezed on these credits. I keep trying to wipe off my TV, but this is on the film. Hey, it's B-movie queen Don Wildsmith, AKA the former Mrs. Fred Olin Ray, and Tegan as the alienator. My nickname was the alienator growing up, mostly because I'd creep people out upon meeting them by immediately talking extensively about serial killers and splatter movies. Not sure what's longer here, the credits or the laser tag scene from earlier. We might hit the 90 minute mark before we get to the actual movie at this rate. Not gonna lie, I really would have guessed our first Fred Olin Ray movie on the channel would have been Evil Tunes. Alienator would have been my second guess. We finally get back to the movie. The Hagenmeister finds a planet that looks suspiciously like Earth to land on. It'd be a shame if he landed amongst a cheaper, completely different cast. And now we cut to just before dawn. I hope we get to see that fist of the throw part again. Hey, have you ever wanted to watch a B-movie actor drink two Budweiser's? Well, here you go. Somehow this new cast is worse than the old cast. Why isn't Joe Pilato in more scenes? Turns out they must have been filming Corman's Fantastic Four nearby because it looks like Johnny Storm just flew over. Why don't we stop and take a little rest and stretch our legs and maybe we can find something? I found Ross Hagen stumbling out of a wrecked spaceship once. It was right behind my favorite Denny's. And the spaceship was a dumpster. Judging by the amount of fog machine abuse here, we may have just wandered into Robo War. Here's Ross doing his best Joe Piscopo. Off cycle. I'm really confused. Rick here is wearing what appears to be a varsity jacket, but he looks like he's at least 38. <laughs> oh yeah, just a Fergasso level of fog machine abuse in this sequence. All that fog must have obscured his vision because he gets Winnebago'd. You hit someone! Tell me about it! And this is where Ross really earns his money. He lay there six hours before they started filming this. Some say he was crying over Doc Tari getting canceled. Do you kids even remember Doc Tari? Christ, I'm old. They carry him inside, and we get another great moment in horror film acting. Uh, ah! Ross really brought his A-game to this one. Six days later, our movie gets the funding to continue, and we join Grizzly, already in progress. Damn. I, I guess I'm just a bit tumpy. <laughs> oh yeah, just what this movie needed, some comic relief. Unfortunately, their poaching has attracted the attention of Calgon from Space Mutiny, so you know someone's about to get run over by a floor polisher. They start jibber-jabbering about stealing the ranger's traps, and I'm pretty sure there's no way out of this vitally important scene. In our other movie, apparently the troll under this bridge is a big Cheech and Chong fan. Our heroes then head to the nearest discount cabin set to find some help. Or maybe a better movie. I could go either way. And they find Calgon as well. This conversation will definitely pad the runtime. He just jumped out in front of me. Nobody could have stopped in time. Nobody. Man, I never thought I'd say this, but I miss Jam Michael Vincent. They eventually get Ross to the ranger station, and they stick a Naruto headband on him just to humiliate him further. And since Cameron Mitchell was too busy filming 14 other movies, Fred had to hire this man's Chinese theater lookalike to film this scene. He's a doctor, and he's up in his prescription of gin. Calgon's got Fred Olin Ray on the line. Yeah, Fred, it's Calgon. I thought I was in this movie with Jan Michael Vincent. Then this happens. I'm no criminal. I'm a pre-law student and I know my rights. Pre-law? Dude, you're like 58. You'll be dead before you finish law school. While they wait for the doc to sleep it off, Ross gives them a good jump scare. Ah! Looks like Ross has kicked the bucket for now, but he'll be back 18 seconds later. Now that he's awake, his new family has some questions for him. Do you have any family? Any friends? Someone you want us to contact? But Ross's performance is a real groaner. <sighs> you know, Ross should join this plucky group. They kind of need a Scooby character to help them solve some mysteries. <sighs> Man, this dude's more wheezy than Isabel Sanford. But after he warns them of the incoming title character, the movie cuts to the first act of the Blob remake. God, look at that special effect. It's a still photo and a laser pointer. And 32 minutes into the movie, the alienator finally arrives. 
Not gonna lie, I thought she'd be taller. Back in our first movie, PJ Souls is getting a bit of a tongue lashing. Hell yeah. No, not like that, you pervs. I mean, she's getting yelled at about the crock pot from earlier. Her outfit is basically what you get if you order a pinhead costume on Wish. Then JMV starts sexually harassing her. Yeah, this dude is definitely on a collision course with HR. After that, Scotty Pimpin shows up. I like that he keeps his brass knuckles on his chain in case he needs to dole out some emergency pimp hands. Dude is like the Cub Scout of pimps. Always prepared. So, I see you graduated from Starfleet Academy. Oh wait, these are just from the University of Phoenix. We then get some exposition as Jam Michael drunkenly explains to Senator C Block that he will destroy Earth if it means getting Ross Hagen back in custody. I want that prisoner dead at any cost. Isn't this how Hitchhiker's Guide started? And as the movie continues to take its sweet ass time getting anywhere, we join Not Camera Mitchell post car breakdown. He's either about to meet the alienator or Jason Voorhees. By God, it's the ultimate warrior. Man, my JR still sucks. Oh, never mind. It's just the alienator. Man, this dude is on fire, which is not surprising since he's like 98% gin. Back at the station, the power's out. It's almost like there's a robot assassin lurking in the woods who has a way of shutting off nearby electricity. Hey, remember our two comic relief poachers? Yeah, they're still in this movie. Or maybe they're in a Fragasso movie judging by all this fog. Don't look now, but it looks like Trumpy from Pod People has shown up. Not sure which I'd rather watch less, Alienator or Pod People. It's a real reverse Sophie's choice. After some expert runtime padding, the Alienator closes in on the Ranger Station. And it's awesome. Awesome. After more jibber jabber, we finally get a good look at the Alienator. Holy shit, it's just a chick in a bikini wearing a flower pop bra, a Phantom of the Opera mask, and a Joe Dirt wig. This just might have become the greatest movie ever made. It's exactly like the Terminator, if the Terminator sucked. <laughs> I love it. Alienator starts blasting, and I'm just hoping the Fergasso fog machine doesn't get damaged or destroyed. The cast decides to get out of Dodge, but Ross has a better suggestion. Kill each other now. Game Warden Calgon then tells the kids to get away while he stays behind to set some traps for the Alienator. Don't worry. She'll see just enough for me to put her right where we want her. Before they go, we have time for another great moment in horror film acting. We don't get rid of them. We're never going to get out of here. I want to go home! All the Warden's traps manage to catch are the hillbillies, but then Trent-infused Vince Neal arrives. Then she terminates the yokels. <laughs> Man, running through the woods in that getup, I bet the bugs ate her alive. There's some sweet pew pew here as Calgon and Alienator go toe to toe. Look at those explosions. This is a good movie. After a lot more shooting, Calgon manages to disable her arm cannon and heads for the hills. They regroup and move out while the Alienator rips off both Predator and Terminator as she does a little self-surgery in this cozy tree. Calgon and his crew finally reach the next Fred Olin Ray set, and it's manned by budget R. Lee Ermey. Inside, he starts talking about Nom. We all know he never made it there once Private Pyle got through with him. And in keeping with the Predator ripoff vibe, we paraphrase, if it bleeds, we can kill it. Colonel, she bleeds yellow ooze. Just as long as she bleeds. The Colonel has had enough with Ross's running man necklace and shoots it off. Ross finally gets his chance to speak, and he starts talking about getting a metal net and throwing it over her. I mean, that's why I always keep a metal net handy. A net made out of some form of metal. Back in space, Jam Michael says what we're all thinking. Why is this taking so damn long? <laughs> at least the people on Earth are shooting at stuff and doing something, Jan. Look at that action. After an obscene amount of padding, Archie starts freaking out. She's on the fucking rock! She's on the fucking rock! And his friend's girlfriend takes an early curtain call. Outside the cabin, Archie goes snooping around and runs across the alienator, who chokes him out with a claw that would have made Blackjack Mulligan proud. Don Wildsmith, meanwhile, has found a crossbow. Unfortunately, all she manages to do with it is recreate a Steve Martin arrow gag. You know what they say about crossbows. They have a lot of drawbacks. While she's distracted by gunfire, Fred from the Scooby Gang catches her with the net. Yeah! Believe it or not, this actually works. I'm not even kidding. Well, I guess that wraps that up. How are they gonna kill another 15 minutes? Oh, Ross is gonna take a heel turn. Probably should have left that necklace on. Ross and Archie head out to the deep woods and Ross shares some goth lyrics. Time to die. A little. Then he gives him pink eye. The next morning, Archie gets a little grabby with his girlfriend and she's not in the mood. Calgon steps in to save the lady, but Archie gives him 45 reasons to stay out of it. Then he lets them in on a little secret that Ross possessed him. I've appropriated Rick's body. He's a small grease spot in the forest. 
Captain Weenie then jumps in to save the day, but all he gets for his trouble is Ross's pimp hand. Ross is about to kick some weenie ass when the alienator intervenes. She's a real chop now and asks questions later kind of chick. Archie's severed head turns back into Ross, complete with bootleg Naruto headband. I admire that dedication to continuity. While movie one celebrates the conclusion of movie two, our budget Star Trek villain throws a tantrum. Back on Earth, the alienator is like, I'm out. I need to go deadlift. Here's a bag of space slugs for your troubles. And finally, we check in on Jam Michael Vincent. Has he gotten drunker since Act 2? Let's see. There are people who are murderers re exiled for a good cause. I think he just went from drunk to numb. Turns out Ross was Scotty's only son, and now Scotty is super pissed at PJ and Jam Michael Vincent. Man, he's so mad he pulls out his Schwartz. Pretty sure Scotty using a lightsaber breaks all sorts of sci fi canon. Jam Michael does a little do si do with Scotty and then runs him right through. Who knew he'd be so gooey inside? Oh sure, now PJ Souls wants to hook up with him. Then we head back to the woods, where everyone watches the alienator head back to her home world, Planet Fitness. So, what have we learned from Alienator? Well, for starters, we learned Fred Olam Ray can make a movie with no nudity in it. Who'd have guessed? I'm not sure that's knowledge I wanted. This one's a weird mishmash that feels like two different movies spliced into one, but I'm a sucker for the high concept pitch of a female bodybuilder Terminator who looks like the love child of the ultimate warrior and Vince Neil traipsing through the woods. <laughs> what can I say? I'm a simple man. But enough about that. Can Alienator stock its way to a respectable barf bag rating? Let's go to the gore card. In terms of gross anatomy, Alienator gets lost in space. We're treated to intergalactic space beetles, one axe decapitation, the splinter removal scene, and one lightsaber death. All in all, this one's pretty light. As such, I can't give Alienator more than a one barf bag rating. This isn't a sick flick, but it's still pretty crazy. Looking for another Terminator ripoff? Then be sure to check out my review of Shocking Dark. You'll find a link here on the screen. I'll meet you over there. Until next time, I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, bringing you all the splatter that matters.